Hey guys, Henning and Morton from Flip Normals here. In this video, we are going to be talking about how you can succeed in a studio. Now, this is not how to get the job. This is after you have got the job. Yeah, so you have to do the hard part first, and then this comes in handy. <laughs> Plenty of videos on how to do that as well. Before that, make sure to subscribe and hit the little notification bell. One thing which is incredibly important, which is something you might not have worked with before, is the moment you get into a studio, NDAs are a big thing of studio life. NDA is essentially a contract which states that you are not allowed to talk about anything you're working on in the studio. A lot of people don't really take this too seriously and they talk way too much about it. In short, you should treat this extremely seriously and not talk about what happens inside the studio anywhere. We, we've seen this happen with some, some guys who worked in the studios we worked in who they, they didn't respect it and they got thrown out incredibly fast. Some people, have, some people have taken to court over this. Some people are sued. So we just want to put some like, like start with this as a first point that NDAs are really seriously and really take them as seriously as they deserve to be. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's, you're, you're effectively discussing studio property and not necessarily the studio you work for, but the movie studios, like it's Lions Head Gate, uh, what are they, Lions Gate? I think it was like, uh, you have Fox as well, Disney, obviously, Disney being probably after Disney got involved, like Marvel got involved and Disney owned Marvel, NDAs got a lot tougher. Like they, they have serious restrictions on all sort of Disney slash Marvel approved studios that they have to work with. Um, security got amped up a lot after after Marvel got involved. Like, you know, that uh, before that, you know, people could like take USBs and put them in their computer and that'd be fine and you were still connected to the internet. But after Marvel got involved, you know, like separate boxes for work that only connect to remote desktops so you can't do stuff. So this is how seriously the, the company takes them. It's also so tricky because when, when you get to work in a studio, at least in a bigger one, it's it's the coolest thing ever. You're seeing stuff from the latest Wonder Woman and the latest Marvel and the latest stuff which nobody's even heard of before. It's the next big thing. And you really want to tell people about it. But but you guys, you, you, you can't. <laughs> no. <laughs> then the next one is that the moment you're in a studio, you have office politics. This is this is just a part of life and you can't get away from this. Office politics is essentially the power struggle within a company. It's people people always want to get to the next level and how do you deal with this? This was something that was also always particularly hard for me because I've always felt that it's complete bullshit. And it's one of those things that well even up to the last day at, at in, in the VFX industry, it was, some, it was hard for me to sort of conform to it because I'm so much against it. But the fact of the matter is it's just, it's just part of everyday life in a studio. And if you don't abide by it or you try to go against it, take it from me, personal experience, your life is going to get a lot harder, like more than it needs to be. Yeah, there are some people you're going to have to be a bit, how do we say this, a bit kinder to <laughs> <laughs> in order for stuff to, to work. Uh, you, you, you can't go in there just with your big shot art student, everything, you just want the rookie's personality come in and be a hot shot. Uh, there is a lot of very serious things happening and there can also be a lot of money in the studio as well. If you're like the higher up you go, the more money you make and a lot of people really want to get to these positions. So some people are nasty, some people are awesome. Uh, just be aware that office politics is a very real thing. One thing I always recommend people to do as well is that when there are moments of downtime, which happens in every studio, doesn't matter which one it is, there are times where there is just nothing to do then you should try to be really proactive about getting new tasks. What I was always trying, always trying to do was let let my uh, my managers know that currently I'm waiting for a texturing fix. I am completely blocked from doing any work before this. And it doesn't matter, oh, you, but can't you do this? No, I can't do that. I am 100% blocked until I get this fix. And so first, let them know that you can't do anything because that's what they hate the most when they have artists who's sitting and just costing them resources and time more importantly so make sure to to bring it up but also be proactive in the sense that if you see issues which are happening later down the line you see that there oh there is an issue with the concept art right now maybe the character can't deform because of this well you should probably bring this up 
early on because it might be a 20 minute fix compared to uh, a fix which is going to have to be shot sculpted or an animators are going to be in such a hard uh, they're going to make our animators lives so hard because you you weren't proactive about it so try to figure out what issues can be solved now which will ease the headaches down the line so much yeah, that kind of ties into our next point, which is, it might come across as weird, but it's the illusion of appearing busy. It kind of ties in with being proactive of, as well. And you might think to yourself, the illusion of appearing busy sounds like, well, it sounds like crap, I guess. Cause, but it like, again, take it from me, like these two things combined, being pro- proactive and appearing busy, was actually two, in a previous job of mine, was actually two things that led me to not getting a raise because I didn't fulfill this enough. I remember sitting in with our artist manager at the time and, uh, you know, it's yearly appraisal. And like the feedback comes in, you get feedback from the show you've been on or the past years and supervisors and people you've worked with, they, they give you feedback. And the feedback, I've never had this happen to me before, but the feedback was so sort of like almost bipolar. Half of it was like, Mon's great to work with. He always delivers on time. His, his, the, the quality of his work is great. The other half was like, well, he's lazy, he doesn't do anything, he doesn't work, blah, blah, blah. All of this was very confusing, eventually boiling down to, you know, I, I had a similar situation as Henning there, where you're like, if you're not actually actively doing anything, reach out to who's ever, whoever's in charge of your department or your leads, your supervisors, and let them know that you actually have nothing to do. I did this as well. I actually let people know I don't have anything to do, but I didn't really follow up on it. I didn't take it that seriously. And in the end, it actually ended up costing me a raise. And this is so annoying because I got a race that year. Yeah. And we worked, you know, th- there was no difference in Morton and I's quality. The difference was that I was maybe a bit better at juggling the office politics mm. around, which is such bullshit because this shouldn't matter. Like it, what should really should matter is is not the illusion of, of being busy or doing a, like doing a few more things so somebody can do some check boxes. What should matter is is really the work. But it does matter. There is no way around it. You have to you have to play the game here. You're, yeah, you're gonna have to cater to the studio and the people that are there. Unfortunately that's that's just how it works. Ideally you would you would just come in and you would do the work and then you would leave again. And you would leave when the work is done, and <laughs> you would just everything would just be fantastic. But it, at least the bigger studios, uh, they're they're big machines. They have a lot of there's a lot of money going around, and a lot of people wanting the jobs as well. So play just play the game in this regard. Yeah, and then that's where you can also like put yourself in a position where you're actually being viewed as helpful and someone who was trying to advance their careers within the studio. An example there again from this from an idle period I had was for about two months, actually, in a studio. I barely had anything to do. It was like a fix here and there, maybe a couple of times a week. I would have like a quick uh, shot sculpt thing. Like there was no character work coming in and all the environment artists were busy on, 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 on tasks. And eventually one of my supervisors walked past me and he's like, so, hey, what uh, what are you doing? I'm like, yeah, I mean, I've, I'm doing absolutely nothing. I've emailed our supervisors and, and everyone around it. And I was like, there's nothing for me to do. And he was like, he almost got angry with me. He was like, well, I have artists working overtime for the past two weeks and you're just sitting here and doing nothing. I'm like, I try to be proactive about it, but, you know, there's there's always more you can do. And that is a tricky balance to find. It is. And this is something you'll find once you have a job. Now we don't want to be super pessimistic about <laughs> all this kind of stuff. It's not that you're. It's not that once you get to uh, into a studio, you're going to be a politician. It's more that day to day, most things are perfectly fine. But these are the kind of things which, after a long period of time, your consistent behavior will catch up to you for better or worse. Yeah. And, so just keep it in mind, yeah. and like how you can actually like use it to your advantage. It's not like it also feels like kind of dirty for me to give advice on just because i'm so against it like i this is something i hate about the jobs is that you have to do this but unfortunately it's part of it there's nothing you can do so the more proactive you can be the you're just going to appear in a better light basically another area as well of of having a job is keeping the job and that in at least in vfx <laughs> I'm not sure about other fields here but in vfx and commercials at least in london it's very contract based you might be hired for a project or you might be hired for a duration so what's what's very common is between three months contracts to a year and then as linear time progresses that contract will 
will come to an end. And oftentimes you, you have people in the studio who really want to extend you. Like you're doing a great job and you really, they really want to keep you on. You know, you, you've been there for a few years. You really know the pipeline, you know the people, everything is well. But the higher ups can't do it because they're being counters. Like they're counting every, they're counting all the money coming in and out. And the next project just hasn't been confirmed yet. Like it's probably coming, but it's not 100% confirmed yet, which means that it's frustrating for the crewing department who wants to keep you on and it's frustrating for you. And they're like, look, we'll, we'll tell you as soon as we possibly can. And then the time, time keeps going and now it's like two weeks until the contract runs out. And it might be the case that they, they can't extend you, not because of your performance, nothing to do with anything in your control. It's just that they actually can't extend you at this point. And this is where it's tricky, where you can't trust their promises. <laughs> no. If like they can, you can have the person who's most sincerely believe that they want to extend you, but on the, until you have the contract signed in your hand, you don't have an extension. I've seen I, I've seen this before, you know, where people they they take this studio's word for granted. You know, they go like, okay, the studio promises them we definitely have work coming in. It's so close to being confirmed. We can extend you in like a week or two. Turns out your contract runs out in two weeks. And you know, I've had I've known people that up until the day they were actually they thought they were getting extended on the day. They're like, okay, this is the last day of the job. Am I getting extended? And they're like, we still don't know. So sorry, we we can't extend you for now. Whereas, what you really have to do there is you gotta look up, gotta look out for number one, you know, and you like go out, be proactive about finding other jobs, look for other studios, talk to other studios. Even if even if the studio really promises you, we are gonna extend you. They, there is no, there are no promises really, unfortunately, because things change. Even if they have a confirmed show and they're planning on extending people, that might change. The next day, the the sort of like head studio that's responsible for for giving out the job goes like, ah, shoot, we uh, we have to reschedule. You know, actor got ill or like he's he's busy. There's a scheduling conf- conflict on another film or something. Well, there you go, thirty people out of a job. Yeah, you know what a promise looks like? A real promise, a signed contract. Anything apart from that is just pure speculation. And particularly when you work in VFX, you're living in an expensive city. Like by definition, nobody is working remotely from a hut in Bali on VFX. You can't do that. So your rent is going to be high and you can't afford to be unemployed for like two, three months. So you have to take care of yourself here. And and I've heard a lot of people say, isn't it, isn't it really bad that I'm looking for work while I'm still employed? Well, if the studio isn't willing to keep you on like if the studio isn't willing to give you the courtesy of a few months of of notice at least a few weeks notice on your on your extension then why should you be why should this be asymmetrical why should you have to be loyal to them it's just the unfortunate truth of it that you will have to go out and seek employment because you can't trust that they will have your back yeah, as a, I guess it's probably going to come off slightly negative, but the studio as a whole doesn't care about you. Like, you are a number for the studio. The people in the studio definitely care about you. And the people who are responsible, you know, HR or or the managers, they're definitely, they definitely care about you, whether you get extended or not. And it's really hard for them as well, because they have to constantly talk to you. They are the ones talking to the artists, being like, sorry, we're s- still not in. I really want to extend you, but my hands are tied. And that's that's true in so many cases. So it's just really important that you take this part seriously and then you start reaching out to other studios. Just, you know, just dipping your feet, your toes in there, just seeing, okay, what is actually available at the moment. So because of all this craziness and you having to stay on top of uh, your contract, one of the easiest ways of doing this is is honestly to connect with your coworkers because in a few months or in, in at least in a year, your coworkers are most likely going to be in a different studio. We, I saw this when I started VFX. You know, you have your core crew in the company, and then just a few years later, they are now scattered across the globe and across the other studios. Which means that the moment they're hiring. They might think of you. They might shoot you an email and be like, hey, dude, you're looking for a modeling job at this studio? And you're like, actually, I am. Or if you're 
or it can go the other way where you are you know that you are out of work in two months and now now you can just start to plant some seeds in the other studios as well and the people you're currently working with they might be the supervisors or the people responsible for hiring in the other studios as well which happens a lot oftentimes when people move studio they go one level up so the person who was a uh, a, a lead in your studio is now a modeling supervisor next studio and the next studio he might be the head of modeling who is now res directly responsible for hiring so not just saying that you should connect with your co-workers just to have a safety net you should connect with them because they're most likely nice people and turns out having friends is a pretty good thing to have but also very much from a safety safety net point of view then you should also uh, keep in mind that being lead is not better than, than being a creative, like being a senior or being a mid or whatever it might be. I see this a lot where particularly people who's brand new uh, out of university or they're still studying, where their, their goal is to be a lead character artist or a lead environmental artist or whatever it might be. When without knowing what a lead actually does, they think that the lead is is the best artist that now you you reach a point where you're you're now the best artist in your class when in reality being lead is being a manager you're now really managing other people you're making sure bidding days are not being overspent whatever it might be what you might be thinking about is uh, something which is often called a principal artist, which might be the best artist. This, of course, depends on studios. Well, a principal artist is, is often an artist of a really high level who's still doing art stuff. So just keep this in mind that the higher up you go in a studio, the less creative and the more management it becomes. If you're a modeling supervisor, chances are you're not actually doing a whole lot of modeling. You're probably setting a lot of standards for the pipelines of the studios, and you're making sure that modeling is done in, in the correct time, in, in, in the correct way. Yeah, a lot of meetings. Uh, a lot of meetings. That's, you know, as a lead, you deal, you, as a lead, you deal with supervisors a lot, so that artists don't have to deal with supervisors um, so unfortunately, a lot of the times as a lead, you don't actually get to do a lot of the work, you get to do a lot of the managing. And that's, that's, the, that's the reality of it. So I would say as a, you know, a senior position is probably the highest you can aim for and still be comfortable in terms of the artistic work before it turns too much into a sort of manager role. There are also a lot of advantages in the studios as well. Uh, a lot of studios, they have uh, they have perks. So you can get like 10, 15% discounts at tons of restaurants. You might have gyms, which are cheaper as well. You might have uh, uh, like free lunches. You have a lot of classes. Uh, I personally attended a few a few like sculpting classes when I was uh, when I was at NPC, which is really nice. They had uh, like just live, live sculpting. They might have live drawing. So really figure out what what advantages are there, are there as well it's a big shame it's a huge shame if you're if you're there for like a few years and you realize you could have saved hundreds of pounds on maybe maybe there's a rail card or something like that or you have be going to the same restaurant and you've got 10 percent discount and now you just you just waste a lot of money vapiano just <laughs> to <laughs> just on your pizzas there yeah i mean there's also things like usually companies will have deals with the software companies to get personal licenses you know maybe you'll be able to and most of the time you get like a license for Maya at home or a Houdini license or something like that. You Obviously, you can't use them for commercial purposes. It's more, you know, for personal learning, but it's worth keeping that in mind. You should also learn how to deal with supervisors as well. One, one thing we, we were talking about prepping this video is that supervisors are can often be a bit lonely because it's, it's you know, the saying is lonely at the top, where in... A lot of people will not treat them as people anymore. They will treat them as like as prison guards. So uh, you had some people now, they got promoted from lead to soup or maybe from, from senior to lead. And suddenly people are afraid of them. Instead of considering their friends anymore or, you know, just artists who's struggling with them as well, they will now just really regard them as something else. Mm -hmm. Somebody who's, who's in control of their lives. So... <laughs> Of course, there is a balance here. You should treat them as people, but you should also treat them as supervisors. Yeah, I had a friend of mine who was promoted to lead. And uh, after that, he said it changed a lot for him in the studio. Uh, people he used to talk to regularly, you know, he would he would walk in the, in the room and people would just stop talking. Like nothing had changed except, you know, his promotion. And that was it. And it's, it's, it's quite sad to see. The same thing goes for supervisors. That's, and that kind of leads me on to another point, like in terms of dealing with soups is that they are people 
And even though their job is to sit in a dark room eight hours a day and feedback films and the work that's been done, they like the discussion. They like, you know, the feedback. They like having someone to spar with. I feel like the worst thing you can do when you go to dailies and you deal with soups is that you go in there, they give you your notes and you're just like, yes, yes. Okay. Thank you, sir. I will do that. Instead, what I found worked really well and, and led me to have a really good relationship with a lot of my supervisors was actually having a conversation about the work that was being done. If you come in, let's say you do a dragon or something and you give it, present a dragon and go like, hmm, the scale's there. What about this? And then you come with suggestions or like counters suggestions if they like change these scales to that you go like what if we make it like this this and this they're like oh, okay yeah that's a good idea or maybe they're like no i don't like that just go ahead but at least having this discussion that it it like for you and for them but also for the work i think it just becomes a lot better for it there are also times in the field where you will be pushed out of your comfort zone and the way i see it, there are two kinds of comfort zone you have the one which you absolutely should be pushed out of you know to make yourself go be more artistic or you know you learn something new and the second part is the one where it's uncomfortable because it's just genuinely a place you shouldn't be when somebody is pushing you into the second part of this into the second part of the comfort zone you should learn to say no. This can be, for instance, that you are, you've been working a lot and now they're asking you if you can do another weekend and you've been doing weekends for ages and you just can't do it. Learn to say no. Or if you are done with the work and for the day, everything is on schedule and, they're, and they come with changes at 5.30, 5.45, 6 o'clock and asking you can, you, can you deliver something early in the morning? You're like, no, 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 I, I can't do that. There are so many times where you just really have to stand up for yourself and just just be firm on your ground. Like this, this intrudes on your onto your personal time. You're being asked something which just you're really not comfortable doing, whatever it might be. Just say no to it and just stand your your ground on this. This kind of ties into it as well, which is you should document everything you're doing. Specify your changes in emails. So let's say you. You're now a lighter and uh, uh, somebody is updating their effects cache. You should just email them, hey, uh, just to confirm uh, the effects cache is being updated and this is these are the changes. The advantages of doing this is that now you can backtrack the production and you can make sure that if something happens, if, you know, for whatever reason that wasn't done correctly, you can at least say, well, at least here is, here is my paper trail of this. Specifically do this when it comes to contract extensions or whatever it might be which is not just day to day but like bigger things in your career this this can really really help you yeah i think it's important like you mentioned as well doing it for the work that has to be done i've done this a lot especially when dealing with rigging you know you we take one part of the production for our modeling like the retop was done and we we send it to rigging and and, and texturing as well uh, if i have a desk meeting with a rigger or a texture artist we talk about something usually i'll go back to my desk and then i'll write an email to them just going like just to confirm these are the changes that we talked about uh should we go ahead and implement them it's just it's to protect yourself but it's also uh, one is to protect yourself but it's also it's just good as a note so you have it so you don't forget what it's about but also just in case something happens someone goes like well we shouldn't have done this well we all agreed that this was the change that we needed to make so and speaking of notes, take notes of everything as your supervisor <laughs> yes. says. Make sure to bring in a notepad. I prefer to have a physical notepad because then it doesn't look like I'm watching memes in dailies. <laughs> Just, you know, have a physical notepad and then write it down there. Because again, this is part of that office politics, which yes. is kind of bullshit, where you should really be able to sit with your phone and do notes. But unfortunately, someone sitting with their phone kind of looks like they're not paying attention in dailies. And uh, now the problem is nobody can see what they're actually writing down. So you get good at <laughs> you get good at writing in the dark. But it, like it serves it serves like a dual purpose as well because usually you'll have a production person in the dailies room as well taking notes for you. The downside is they don't know what they're taking notes about. Most likely they don't know the technical language or whatever is actually being talked about they're just trying to transcribe by ear so oftentimes you'll get notes from your daily sessions that don't make sense and maybe you weren't you were like paying half attention a little bit of sleep because it's nice and comfortable and, and dark in the daily dailies rooms uh, but if you know if you take your own notes you're definitely covered there and you will also get a lot of emails during the day and the vast majority of them are not relevant at all 
I, I had a friend of mine, and I was asking, I was working with him in the studio, and I was asking him, "How do you deal with all the emails?" And he just looked at me, and then he held down the escape, the delete key, and then he, <laughs> after like a minute or so, he was like, "Ta da!" <laughs> and that's how he dealt with them. Now that is absolutely one way of doing it. The way I prefer to do it was I, I filtered <laughs> not my the emails. good way. Yeah, it's it's not a super way because now you just delete absolutely everything. A better way is to to filter emails. Now there are a lot of things which. It's just completely irrelevant. You're going to get everything into one. So just filter out stuff you don't need into separate folders. And you can even filter out emails from specific people into specific folders. Like emails from this supervisor, you're always going to read because you get notified from that. Yeah, I had usually, what I had to set up was like every time there was a dailies email, I would filter that into a black box <laughs> yes. because I take my own notes. So I never needed to look at that. I also divided it into shows. Sometimes you're on multiple shows and it, it gets really cluttered in your inbox once that happens. The same with feedback notes or different threads. It's really nice to stay organized in your inbox there. It's, I mean, you might come back the next day because people work overtime and there's automated render farm emails that come in. You might have 200 emails once you're, once you're in and having to look through that in the morning maybe takes half an hour. So if you can set up filters early on, it's just going to save you a lot of time. You also need to figure out what what is the company's policies regarding sick days and holidays as well. How many holidays you have, that depends on the company. Some some studios are closed over Christmas, some studios are not closed. And this depends entirely on where you're based as well. If you are in the States, you will very much have to figure out what is the company's healthcare plans. If you're not in the States, you don't have to worry about this because of socialism. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but then you're covered. And uh, also sick days as well. When do you get sick days? Uh, do you have sick days after day one? Is it after uh, after six months, three months, a year? This depends entirely from studio to studio. Yeah, I was at a studio at some point where I actually had to get surgery. And it, technically it wasn't really covered by the studio and I didn't have sick days for it. But I, I talked to the studio about the surgery. I, it was a three-week period I had to take off and... They're actually very kind to accommodate that. So, so maybe even if it's not in your contract, you can always talk to the, the studio about it in HR and see what you can figure out. You will also be very surprised by figuring out how tiny the industry is. If you're looking at the big studios, yeah, sure, there are several thousand people working there. But then you start to subdivide it down into different departments. Maybe there are... Like in if you're if you're a modeler again we keep talking about that because that's what we know maybe you're looking modeling out of a thousand people maybe there are thirty modelers or so and now in our case now take these modelers and they're over like ten different shows now you have like three or four modelers per show and maybe like five ten of those are creature modelers which means out of a thousand people there are ten five or ten people who will do what you do and then do the same thing for the other studios around in 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 the city and you're left with just really a tiny portion of people doing the same thing as you it's way smaller than you think the way we've been talking about it is that there are like 12 people in the industry and treat them as such if one person like if one person has a negative impression of you that can be that can have pretty big uh, imp- have a pretty big impact on your life or the opposite if you have a great rep this will also spread as well like fire there are some people who they just have a really good rep and they just get hired everywhere all the time they have like six jobs at the same time yeah and another thing that sort of ties into that which is we're doing we will be doing a video on this at some point in the future we haven't just haven't prepped it enough yet but it's figuring out what your colleagues you know how much they, do they make uh, it's like starting to spread that conversation about money i know it's a topic that's uncomfortable for a lot of people and a lot of companies actually make quite a big effort in terms of sending out emails uh, constantly reminding you that talking to your colleagues about your salary it falls under your nda uh, specific companies have specific contractors I have worked at companies that stated this. None of that was ever true. Uh, It has never been part of my contract that I couldn't talk about my salary. So even if you're not comfortable about doing it in public, if you can do it in private with especially the colleagues that you have in the same department, figure out sort of like a range of salaries, that's not just going to help you, but it's also going to help them when it comes to future salary negotiations. If you change studio at some point, you kind of have a a gauge you can kind of gauge okay what can i expect 
uh, sometimes they'll actually ask you, you know, what uh, what are you expecting in terms of, of salaries? So if you've talked to a colleague of yours that might be, you're starting as a junior, they might be mid, and you're like, okay, I can expect to maybe increase it by like five or, or maybe even 10K this year, you know, then you can present that number. Whereas if you don't have any of that information, you're kind of left in the dark and you might be underselling yourself. The only way to know if you are underpaid is to figure out what other people make. Simple as that. Then you also need to look out for your coworkers. If everyone looks out for each other, now you have a safety net here. I've seen this before where sometimes people screw up. I screw up. Morton screws up. Uh, everyone screws up at some point. And then having some people who will look out for you is so valuable. This has happened a few times where I've seen people really struggle with certain tasks. Maybe maybe it was, it was a task which was too big for them, but they still have the responsibility now. And just being able to go over there and just help them a little bit, just give them a quick hand and and just show them some techniques, show how you would approach this can have a massive impact on uh, on their performance and on your performance. And it, everything just goes around. Good yeah, I mean, deeds it's, come around. it's really like in a studio there, there's, of course, it's kind of a competition because like it's a small field. Everyone wants to do their best and blah, 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 blah. But at the end of the day, everyone is still interested in doing the best work they can possibly do. Uh, so that's why you should also not be afraid to ask questions. Like you shouldn't be afraid to go up to a person and be like, I've seen that you've done this and I have a similar task. Could you give me some pointers? And most of the time, 99% of the time, people will love that. They'll love to give you feedback. They'll love to be like, yeah, maybe I can do this and do this. Once has it happened. I work with an absolute asshole. I went up to him. I, I was doing these uh, like jackets or clothing or something like that. And uh, my, my lead was suggesting, hey, maybe go talk to this guy. He he did it on a, on a previous show. And I, I walked up to him and I was like, hey, um, I heard you were doing this uh, in the previous show. Can you help me sort of like with a setup for this? And he just looked at me and he was like, yeah, I mean, it's easy. You should know how to do that. I was like, <laughs> you know what? Thanks. That was that was really helpful. But that is really the exception. For, like I said, it's only happened once. Every other time people have been very accommodating and very helpful. Yeah, people are generally very nice, which also leads us to one of our last points here, which is that you should really try to to stay positive. You should try to have a positive vibe. If you have people like the one, uh, the guy Morton just talked about, <laughs> then that's it. Just it just creates a, such a toxic vibe in the yeah. entire company. It really is like the old one where like the one bad apple can spoil everything. Like you, if somebody is just in a really pissy mood, that can just spread in in the entire department. It's not like you're sitting and there are two thousand people in the same floor. You might be sitting in rooms with ten people. So your your actions can definitely have impacts on other people. Or the opposite. If you're super happy and cheerful. That, that also spreads as well. Uh, every room and the companies are very different depending on, on how people yeah, treat each other there. So really try to, to stay positive, start, start to stay optimistic about things, even when stuff goes sour, which shows sometimes do. Yeah, maybe, you know, take a break. Uh, go out for lunch with a bunch of your friends or like a bunch of the co-workers. Talk, like just suggest something. Okay, maybe we'll all go out for lunch because we just had a crappy delivery or something. Just anything to, to like help lighten the mood that really it, it does a lot for you but it also does a lot for just the the mood as a whole i think so like just to sum it up here like I, I, working in a studio can be absolutely amazing you can you can work on some of the coolest things with some of the best people around the, the what we're talking about now is, are there more things to keep in mind so that your experience is the best it can be and so that you're also protecting yourself as well stuff happens sometimes just make sure that you are covered and you have a safety net as well a lot of this is, is obvious, don't break NDA, you know, these kind of things. That's like, a, just don't do it and you're fine. So yeah, really hope that this video here has been useful for you. Let us know what questions you have about um, like working in a big studio, whatever it might be. We are totally open for making new videos on this as well. And make sure to subscribe, like, and leave a little comment and hit the notification bell as well. Yeah, so we have, I mean, obviously we've worked in studios and a lot and we've had a lot of experience and a lot of different things have happened during our time there uh it's hard to sometimes come up with topics that we, we don't really think about ourselves so if you are interested in any sort of topic in the pipeline or in the production whatever it is uh you know leave it in the comments and, and maybe we'll do a video about it
So if you're looking for training or high quality assets, make sure to stop by the Flip Normals Marketplace. And if you're interested in supporting us by buying our merchandise, you can check that out in the description below.